Okay, so now you've been looking at, you, you know the permit types that are available. You're starting to look at whether or not you want to have a nutrient management plan. You've done some of the risk assessment part. Now, once you have a nutrient management plan, part of that requires balancing those nutrients. Okay, so again, we're balancing nutrients because we want to make sure we're using the nutrients beneficially, not creating an environmental problem. Um, nitrogen. Nitrogen is actually one of our easier ones to use all of it beneficially, except that nitrogen is very mobile. It changes. It can volatilize. So manure, do we lose a lot of our nitrogen? Yeah. And we, do you know what form it lo we lose it in? Ammonia. ammonia. Yeah, ammonia is not the sweetest smelling thing in the world. And so we can lose a lot of nitrogen. It can also go in a form called nitrate, which just leaches, moves through the soil very, very rapidly, which can cause some of our problems. So we can kind of manipulate or play with our nitrogen retention somewhat. So our current practices, we actually tend to lose a lot of nitrogen in our manure storage systems that we have in the U.S. Manure stack, can you guess how much nitrogen we lose? 50%? 50 yeah, about half. Depends on if it's warm or cold. If, we, if it's warm, we're going to lose more nitrogen. It's going to volatilize as ammonia. If it's cold, it'll slow that down. But we generally lose about half, is a good estimate, of that nitrogen in a manure stack. After it's spread in the field, do you lose any? Yeah, after it's spread in the field, actually, yes, we lose a lot when it's spread in the field because you're exposing even more of it to the atmosphere and to, the, to volatilize. And so unless you incorporate it right away, and then that helps trap it. Um, I would say it'd be better to pile it in a stack because at least you'll trap a lot of what's in the inside. You'll lose what's on the outside crust. If you apply it to the field, it's all being exposed to the atmosphere, and you're going to lose probably almost all of that nitrogen. What kind of timeline would you lose about 50 percent? Dave? <laughs> I'm guess, well, it depends some on how well it crusts or how warm it is. Right. So I think you're looking at probably a couple, two, three months. Yeah, but it really depends. If it's in the winter, you're not going to lose nearly as much. If you're in the summer, you're probably going to lose quite a bit. And that's just the temperature. Composting. Composting has lots and lots of benefits. But composting also results in a lot of our nitrogen being volatilized off into the atmosphere. Covered storage is actually really about the only way we can really retain most of that nitrogen. That or applying it almost instantly and incorporating it into the soil. So in the, if you go into like the European countries, they actually basically try to have almost all of their waste management in a covered type of facility. The dairy barns and stuff actually have all slatted, mostly have slatted floors with really tiny little holes because they're trying to minimize any loss of that nitrogen into the atmosphere. Um, in Canada, when they compost, they actually require most of those co composting operations to be under covered facilities so they can trap that nitrogen. So we, I know you don't like our regulations, but they can be worse other places. Does liquid manure lose any from evaporation? Yes, it can also lose it. Now, the nitrogen will want to stay more in the ammonium form, a, a liquid version of ammonia, but you'll, you'll still get some losses. We can actually get some losses in another form called just N2 gas, and that's not harmful to the environment, but you're still losing the benefit of that nitrogen. So covered storage is really the way to retain more of that nitrogen. So especially as nitrogen fertilizer gets to be more expensive, if you have to look at upgrading, that's something you might want to consider is how much of that nitrogen you can retain. Phosphorus. This one is kind of our little problem child. We need phosphorus, and phosphorus has um, a tendency to be not available if it's cold and wet. This is a corn plant that's showing phosphorus deficiency. That purple around the edge is a classic phosphorus deficiency symptom. If you get into the Midwest, they were always told to dump more and more phosphorus onto the soil because there's only a very, very small percentage of the phosphorus that's available to the plant at any one point in time. Most of it's in either an organic pool or a mineral pool, and it replenishes, kind of equals out over time. But when it's cold and wet, it doesn't mobilize very readily to replenish it, and then the plants would show phosphorus deficiency. So as I was going to graduate school, they kept saying the recommendations were to keep dumping on more and more phosphorus because it's really not toxic to the soil. Since then, we've realized that it can actually leach if we get too much. If you saturate the soil, it can actually move down into the groundwater. Or it binds to the soil particles, and if we have any erosion at all, you're losing that phosphorus. And again, the reason we worry about that is because it gets into the waterways and causes eutrophication.
And when we think about phosphorus actually kind of builds up. We can have problems with it building up in our soils if we apply a lot of manure. So if we're looking at our phosphorus levels, um, how much, if we have the phosphorus from one dairy cow, and I used NRCS numbers for a 1,375 pound lactating dairy cow, and it's going to generate about 380 pounds of nitrogen per year, although Alan was telling me that actually those might, numbers might be low. And we're going to say it's generating about 157 pounds of phosphorus in a year. How many acres of alfalfa do you think we need to util utilize the phosphorus? It really depends on, whoops, I deleted the wrong one. Sorry, I need to delete the next line. To delete, to use up the, oh no, that's the right one, sorry. For the phosphorus, if we generate 157 pounds, if you're at 8 tons to the acre, it's only going to take about an acre and a half. If you're, it depends on where you're at on your production. If you're at 4 tons, it's going to take about 3 acres. So it really depends on your production level as to how much phosphorus you're going to utilize from that dairy cow. Okay. And again, if those numbers, realize that those numbers are, are oftentimes just a general guide. That's why they want you to do the manure testing and the soil sampling so you can see what actually really happens in your operation. We, yeah, we, we can post it all on the internet, so each one of them. I think I didn't put some of the question ones on. Okay. On the soil sampling, you only are required to go down a foot for nitrogen, and for phosphorus, that's all they, they require. For the nitrogen, we actually recommend that you do a, a 1 to 12 inch sample, and then a 12 to 24 inch sample, so you can really see how much nitrogen is there and available for your plant, so you aren't over applying nitrogen. But by the most standards, the only requirements, you only have to sample the top foot. Okay, so if you have too much phosphorus, and I'm going to pick on the cane dairy a little bit. I'm slowly working on my nutrient management plan for the cane dairy. We've gone out and sampled the fields around here, and some of them are just fine. They're within reason. And what's our top, kind of our top level for phosphorus? 100 parts per million is kind of our drop dead. We don't want to apply more phosphorus after that. <coughs> we actually have a couple of fields here that are at 350 parts per million. So not all of them, just a couple of them. But those fields don't need any more manure for a long time until they can utilize that up. If we have too much phosphorus, or if you see that you're starting to build up phosphorus in your soil, you may want to try and work on that ahead of time rather than getting it to where you can't apply any manure because that can be problematic. Question? No. Go. Okay, if your phosphorus is way high and your nitrogen is down, that's when you need to go into the commercial fertilizer, basically. That's, right now, that's really problematic. Um, again, it's really a matter of any water erosion or wind erosion and the particles. The phosphorus binds to the soil particles, and that's why they don't want it to get over 100 parts per million. Um, again, that's, a, that's an NRCS guideline, pretty much, and so that's, that's not one worth, worth setting. Um, then what you need to be looking at is a way to use up that manure. And we'll talk a little bit about a few of your options, potential wait, options. Wait a minute. You hmm? said you've got to figure out some way to use up that manure? Yeah, or get rid of it, and we'll talk about a couple options, okay? So, yeah, I, I realize. But this is one of the things, if you're doing your soil testing, you can kind of watch and see if you're going to be running into a problem. You can actually start to change, look at your crops that you're growing. Alfalfa pulls up quite a bit of phosphorus. Corn silage will actually pull up even more phosphorus. So that might be an option. Maybe you want to consider growing a little bit of corn silage. If you're putting in a small grain as part of the rotation, you might want to consider wheat instead of barley because wheat will pull up more phosphorus. You might want to start looking at things that can help pull out more phosphorus. That's one option. Another thing to do, most of you are excellent livestock producers, but you can work on improving your yield. How many of you are really, really good crop producers? Okay. Typically, people have a strength in one area or another, and I'll bet most of you, you really focus on the livestock production. But if you can increase the yield, you can pull out more of that phosphorus from that soil each year and not only get extra additional feed, but be helping pull down and reduce that phosphorus level. So that's another option you can do. And this is, again, the m b better your yield, the more phosphorus that you're pulling out. We can look at diet changes. So uh, especially dairy cows, we often add phosphorus into the diet. And why? Why do we supplement with phosphorus? It's a limiting nutrient. <laughs> and we really want, we need to have a certain level of phosphorus in that diet to maintain reproductive capabilities. 
And so what's kind of happened over the years is if a little bit's good, well, more should be better. And we definitely don't want to err on the side of not having enough. We want to have to, you know, plenty. In your packet, there should be this fact sheet with phosphorus levels that Alan Young and I wrote. But it goes through m several studies and it shows that you can actually have, most dairies could lower their phosphorus levels between 0.33 and 0.4 percent is perfectly fine. You don't want to get below 0.33 or you might have problems with the reproductive efficiency. But you definitely don't need to be up at 0.5 or 0.6. All you're doing if you do that is you're paying to add phosphorus into the diet and then you're having to deal with it on the back end because the more phosphorus that goes in, the cow is only going to use a certain amount and the rest just comes out. So you can look at trying to change that diet, reduce the phosphorus levels that you're feeding them so that you can get that, that phosphorus level lower in that manure, which can help alleviate some problems. Um, if you have poultry or swine, you can actually feed an enzyme called phytase, and that can help make more of the phosphorus available. So they actually can utilize more of the phosphorus that you feed them. You don't have to feed them as much, and you have less going out in the waste. So those are a couple diet changes you can make. If you really have too much and you start running into problems, say your levels are 350 parts per million or whatever, you can't add any more manure technically, then you have to start looking at some other more creative options. You can try and compost it and see if you can get people to take it or get people to haul it away. Um, I, know some, I know some dairies that actually compost their manure they're close enough to an urban center, they can actually sell their compost. They're making more off their compost than they are off of their milk, which is really sad. But that, so if you're in the right location, it can benef work for you. Again, realize that that compost can have a big benefit, that the organic matter. So maybe you can find, start hauling it, maybe it's economical to haul it out to some of those fields, the dry farms and stuff, and utilize it that way. 20 bucks a load, 20 bucks a ton. It, it'll vary a lot, I think, on quantity and where you're at. If you're, you know, by an urban area, 10 to 20 bucks to pick up load is probably pretty common. More comments? Okay, so this, this area is getting $15 retail. Okay, so, you know, sometimes you have to get, be creative then, but that's one of the reasons why you do the soil testing, because hopefully you can avert a problem before you get to where it's a really, really big problem. Um, the other thing, there's actually a couple of new technologies coming out that might be kind of interesting for you. I'm going to start this around. Let's see, in there. One, I'll start one back about here. I'm handing out a couple little containers. It's got steel slag in it, and that's the remnant off of the steel production process. It looks kind of like volcanic crushed rock. Comes in different sizes. They break it up to different sizes. But they're actually using this in New Zealand and in the Northeast a little bit for cleaning up the phosphorus, removing phosphorus from munici municipality water. Um, we actually took it and did a preliminary study to see if we could use that to remove phosphorus from dairy lagoon effluent. <coughs> and what's happening, you run the effluent over it and it's a chemical reaction, but it binds to the phosphorus with a very, very tight chemical bond. And what we did at Utah State, we put the effluent in the bucket at the top. We filled these little PVC columns with the steel slag. We let the effluent sit in there for 12 hours, drained it off the bottom, refilled it, and continued that for four months. And this was just a feasibility study to see if it even had any possibility of working. And we figured that four months was the minimum length of time that we, we needed in Cache Valley to even make it even remotely con worth considering. And we got our lagoon effluent from a dairy out by Corinne. And what we found was that actually it does remove the phosphorus. My big fear was that it would work at the beginning and then plug up with the, all of the organic matter. But it actually worked all the way through for the four months. It removed about 65 to 70 percent of the phosphorus over the four month study. It started at about 90 percent removal, dropped down to about 50 percent in that four months. But it actually it continued to work. It did not plug up. We really thought it might plug up. We even had one treatment where we took extra organic matter out of that dairy lagoon effluent, piled it on the, the steel slide, because I really, really thought it would plug up. I figured it would work for about two days or two weeks and then plug up and be this awful, awful mess. And so I was, I was pretty skeptical as to whether it would, would really work, but it did work. We also had one treatment outside in the cold, so we could see what happened during the cold weather. 
And amazingly, the cold treatment was the most effective at removing the phosphorus. There's a little tiny biofilm that grows over it, and we think that actually interferes slightly. So the cold growth or the cold temperature inhibited some of that biofilm growth. So this is one that may have some potential. Um, some of the producers up in Cache Valley are using the steel slag. They're purchasing it and then applying it as kind of like gravel in their roadways. And so the theory is that you could take this in after it's saturated with the phosphorus, put it in your roadways, and because of the very tight chemical bond, it's not likely to release phosphorus or just very, very slowly. And so there's still more testing to be done on that, but it's one that might have some potential. Another one is struvite, and this is one they're doing out in Washington. Struvite is aluminum magnesium phosphate, and it forms this little whitish, brownish crystal. It's kind of a precipitate. It's kind of like a little kidney stone. Um, some livestock will actually get the little struvite, um, like little stones or whatever in their, their body. That's not a desirable thing, kind of like kidney stones aren't a good thing for us. Um, but it's a naturally occurring process. This one on the right is actually an anaerobic digestion pipe. And they were noticing that the, it seemed to not, didn't have much volume. The struvite actually was precipitating out and caking the, the pipe just like wine kind of does in our pipes. So struvite, it's a naturally occurring precipitate in the right place. It can work well in the wrong place. We don't want it in the anaerobic digestion systems. What they're doing is they're actually trying to get it pre to precipitate when they want it so they can remove that struvite and it's in this form. It comes out with that whitish crystal and they're getting that by dropping the pH, get the struvite to form, remove that phosphorus in the struvite and then they can actually take that struvite and apply it to fields and it works just like a slow release phosphorus fertilizer. So it has some great potential. It removed about half of the total phosphorus and 70 to 80 percent of the more liquid form of phosphorus. This is one I really think has some great, great potential. We'll, we'll see how it comes along. They have it working very well on dairy waste and they're working on getting to work with swine waste and it's looking promising. Um, it would probably, but I, wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. There's a lot of, yeah, I wouldn't. There's a lot of minerals that you don't really want in high concentrations in the steel slag and they're really fine. Yeah, it would probably bind a little bit of the phosphorus, but you're also going to be adding a lot of elements that you don't want that could be toxic if they released. So I wouldn't, I personally wouldn't recommend doing that. On a roadway is one thing, in your field is, a, is another.